Um, I am delighted to introduce our speaker today. Um, I can't see her on my screen, or oh, I've just spotted her. She's got Karen Denning on her name on the, on the screen. Um, and Dr. Karen Harrison Denning is a nurse by background, a doctor through her PhD, um, and she is currently head of research and publicity at Dementia UK. Now, Karen has had probably a lifelong passion about improving the care of people living with dementia and their families. Um, and has driven many, many innovations in care of, of, of people um, at a high level through influencing NICE guidance and at a very grassroots level. Um, and one of her great passions is about Admiral Nursing and um, the role that Admiral Nurses have in supporting people and particularly supporting them in end of life. And that's what her PhD was on, which was about planning around the future and at uh, the end of life um, and end of life care. So Karen, I'm going to hand over to you today now. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing all that you've got to say. Great. If you could put up the slides, Karen, there's another Karen, that would be great. Well, that, that was an introduction that I don't feel worthy of. Um, I, as Christine said, I've, I have a almost a nursing career long passion for working in the field of dementia care, which goes back to probably the late 70s. So I'm giving my age away a bit there, aren't I? Um, do we have the slides yet? I do. Does everybody else nod if you can see the slides? Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Lots of nodding heads. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're on, we're on to the aim. So what, what am I going to talk about? And it's, it's a privilege to be um, invited to give this lecture. My roots, particularly my first two nursing qualifications, go back to Leicester. I actually trained to be a mental health nurse and a learning disability nurse in Leicestershire. Um, indeed, just up the road from uh, Loros. And then I went on to do my general nurse training um, in Yorkshire after the point I decided I wanted to work with people with dementia. Because dementia doesn't travel alone, it comes with comorbidity often, given that it affects an older population. So I, I've looked at five different parts to this lecture, and it's been a long time in writing. As Christina said, we planned to give this last year. So I've added COVID-19 into it. So I want to give an overview on uh, dying with and from dementia, because dementia is a life-limiting condition. I want to give you a flavor of my early inquiries during my PhD, during my doctoral studies, because they were very much driven, as Christina said, by palliative and end-of-life care in dementia. And my research questions came very much out of clinical practice. Then I, I want to sort of bring your attention to a range of studies that uh, I, I'm now working on, not just in the UK, but wider. And then I'll finish off with a, a sort of a postscript about COVID, given that we're, we're over a year now into when the first cases came into the UK. I think, I think we, we do need to mention it. So if I can have the next slide, please. So dementia is uh, largely uh, a disease of an aging population. Um, the, the highest risk factor for dementia is age. But having said that, we mustn't forget that there is a significant portion of the population under the age of 65 that also have dementia. And indeed, I was mentioning to Christine earlier, I'm just transcribing an interview that I've conducted with a 50 year old woman who's caring for her brother with dementia. Um, and, and, and very traumatic it was to listen to. But by the age of 2040, we're going to see um, a, a substantial increase in the numbers of dementia. And largely that's because we're an aging population. People are living longer 
um, longer into old age, but not necessarily longer in health. So can I have the next slide, please? So what is dementia? I, I'm conscious that we have a very mixed audience. So um, for those that you, you know that are, are professionals, then bear with us. But dementia is an umbrella term that includes all types of dementia. Um, and dementia, each of those will be caused by different diseases. So um, several disease conditions that primarily affect the brain. Dementia is progressive neurological condition that currently there is no effective cure. We, we have some treatments, but those treatments tend to be more of a psychological or a psychosocial nature. It, we don't have any curative or reversing type treatments as yet. And the typical symptoms are memory loss, disorientation, you might understand that as being confused, impairment of thinking and reasoning, so decision making becomes problematic. People often have problems with language. In some dementias, you may get changes to the personality. And, and many people with dementia at some point during the illness experience what we call behavioral and psychological symptoms. And they might be things like agitation or restlessness or apathy. And we over time see a decline in a person's ability to perform what we call activities of daily living. So they're the very functional parts about how we exist like cooking, cleaning, washing. So I can have the next slide please. I think in addition, even though we're, we're uh, over a decade almost from the National Dementia Strategy that aimed to raise awareness of dementia, still only two thirds of people with dementia actually receive a formal diagnosis. Now, nearly half of those will have a mix of conditions in addition to their dementia. It's like I said before, that uh, as it affects an older population, we will also see other conditions such as diabetes or heart rate, you know, high blood pressure or cancer. Um, and I think that one of the problems is that half of those with dementia are admitted to acute hospitals, when they actually do start that um, stage of their illness, we found that uh, almost half of those will only have six months left to live. So we do, we are gaining a greater awareness of some of the um, indications of when we might consider end of life care. Now, there are multiple challenges for professional carers um, working with people with dementia, um, but also importantly for family carers who still, despite um, an advanced health and social care system that we have in the UK, still provide the majority, the lion's share of care for people with dementia. So can I have the next slide? Oh, you've done it. As I said before, dementia does not come alone. It doesn't travel alone. And, and many people with dementia will have other comorbid conditions. And indeed, some of those people will have multiple morbidity. So when we talk about comorbidity, we usually think of one other disease. But in multimorbidity, you can have several on top of the dementia. And certainly, we, we see quite high numbers of multimorbid conditions in people with dementia. I think what is important to also consider is frailty. Now, when I first started my nurse training, frailty wasn't deemed a condition, but it's now become identified as a condition. And I think that certainly most, a lot of older people would be quite amazed to think that they were actually being defined as frail. But frailty is a state that encompasses losses in physical, psychological, or social domains, where we actually see our, um, the person becoming um, less, less uh, physically able, less mobile, less interactive socially. And often what we often see in, in the dementia care field is that frailty and dementia often come closely connected. They come close together. So can I have the next slide, please? Now, in addition to this, as I've said, uh, in terms of multimorbidity, the average person with dementia has 4.6 uh, 
other chronic illnesses. Now, it, it's like when they talk about the, the average number of children to a family as being 2.2. We don't get 0.2 of a child. Um, you get whole children. But in this instance, this is an average. So, you know, I've seen people with dementia with upwards of, of 10 other multiple conditions. And the, the problem with this is that it's not that you experience those 10 different conditions separately, they have a cumulative effect. So in effect, the, the effects of having more than that one condition or more than those three conditions is usually greater than the sum total. I think if we added to this delirium, infections, falls, fecal incontinence, constipation, and epilepsy, which all occur more frequently in dementia, over a third of people with dementia will also have moderate or severe frailty. So over 45% of those with severe frailty were also found to have moderate dementia. So it, it, in a sense, they're, they're almost like bedfellows. I mentioned earlier that there is no treatment or cure for dementia. And sadly, that is still the case. And what we now know of more recently is that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are the leading cause of death in the UK. Originally it was cancer, but now it's been superseded. And in a way, the good news is that people are living longer, but the bad news is that we're living longer with other conditions, and this is the case with dementia. Now, it's likely to be higher statistically than this, because we're, the data we're going from is data that's included on a death certificate. And there are still instances whereby um, whoever signs a death certificate may be persuaded by family members not to include dementia because this, it's still stigmatized. Or indeed, they may fail to recognize that actually dementia is um, a progressive and terminal illness. And when I was a consultant admiral nurse in London, which is not that long ago, um, a family member, we enabled his wife to die at home with cancer. And she had young onset dementia and died at the age of 55. The husband took the death certificate, which said the primary cause of death was dementia to the coroner um, at, who said, people don't die with dementia and sent that death certificate back to be rewritten. And it's such a tragedy that we're, we're still in a situation where we're not accurately recording these things. So that having been said, where do people die? And I'm sure this is a, of interest to the hospice movement as well. O only half of people with dementia, um, sorry, half of people with dementia die in a care home, just over. Approximately 40% of people with dementia still die within an acute hospital setting. Only 5% approximately die in their own home, despite the fact that this is, might be what they wish to happen. And, and we're still seeing a very small percentage of people die in hospice, even given that this is a terminal condition. But there are different reasons for that. I can have the next slide, please. I think that there are things that we need to measure more than just the place of death in dementia. And certainly health care strategy over at least the last 10 years has been attempting, I can hear very a lot of noise in the background, so maybe some microphones need to be on mute, especially the one with the dog. <laughs> um, so it, it's important that we don't just measure the place of death because that, that's giving us a false sense of perception because over recent uh, years, uh, there's been um, claims by, by the Department of Health that it's great, strategy is working, and we're seeing fewer numbers of people with dementia actually die in acute care. But I think we have to scratch a bit below the surface because that's not the entire picture. What we are finding is that we're not necessarily stopping people with dementia going into hospital, and arguably a lot of those instances are inappropriate admissions, but what we are seeing is that we're seeing an exponential rise month by month in the last year of life to the point where 
uh, the numbers of de uh, people admitted into hospital within the last month of their life has become quite significant. Now, this is important information because what, what we're seeing is that hospitals are still admitting those people. So there's still the uh, numbers of inappropriate hospital admissions, but they're increasing the nearer to death that that person with dementia gets. It's just that the acute hospitals are getting better at sending them back out again. Now, the cumulative effect of those admissions into hospital for that person with dementia and that family are huge. Ho acute hospitals are not the best place for people with dementia for lots of different reasons. So what we should be doing is not only trying to ensure that people die in the most appropriate care setting, ideally where they would wish or prefer to, but also to try and stop those inappropriate bouncing in and out of acute hospital in that last year of life. Now the next slide, okay. So a lot of the work that I'm, I'm talking about was conducted by um, King's College in London, where the Dame Cicely Saunders Research Centre is, the, 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 almost the, the sort of centre of um, hospice-related palliative care research. And it suggests that care homes actually are getting better at palliative and end-of-life care in dementia. So the numbers of admissions that we see coming from care homes inappropriately in the last year of life are actually reducing. What we are seeing is that a lot of those admissions where people are bouncing in and out of hospital in the last year are actually where people still live in their own homes and there is not the effective community supports to either treat them within their own homes or to prevent those hospital admissions happening. So I think that this is this is where we start to scratch beneath the surface of some of the research um, and if we're just counting numbers of deaths in, of people with dementia in acute hospital and seeing a reduction we, we shouldn't morally stay there we should still continue to look at how can we continue to improve the end of life care for people with dementia. Have the next slide please. Okay so what is the role of care homes in end of life care and dementia? Now there's approximately 400, nearly half a million beds available to care homes of which one third require end of life care, one third of residents. 75 percent plus of residents of care homes will have dementia. So in effect, care homes, their, their main business is frailty and dementia. But actually less than 50 percent of the care home beds in the UK are registered to provide nursing care. Yet I've just mentioned the amount of comorbidity, multimorbidity and frailty in this population. We're talking about some of the most complex cases in older people, yet many still live in uh, settings where there is no resident or 24 hour nursing care. Now, one in three people will die in a care home, as I've mentioned, and they're, they're often one of these three people are, are temporary residents. So there's still a failure to recognize that actually this person is uh, at end of life. Now, the deaths in care homes increased from 80,000 to over 120,000 in the last six years. Now, in a way, is, is that the right thing to happen? If we're recognising that somebody's near the end of life, should we not see care homes as actually being the, the hospices of people with dementia, if you like? But I think that one of the things that the government more recently is trying to do um, to combat um, the inappropriate admissions and to upskill uh, care homes, both nursing and residential homes, <clears throat> is the way that they're planning to reorganise uh, primary care um, and primary care networks, as now they are being called. And part of that work will involve what we call the enhanced health into care homes approach. And that will, in just to name a couple of instances, it will work in mobilising a multidisciplinary approach to care in care homes so that residents in care homes can access the same 
um, services such as occupational therapy or physiotherapy or palliative care specialists that you would expect to access if you lived in your own home. And also that enhanced health into care homes will have a strong educational component to, to upskill home care staff. Can I have the next slide, please? I think it's less likely than people without dementia to receive equivalent care in similar health, you know, with similar health and conditions and experiences. But what we see um, people with dementia having complex needs, they often have poor access to equivalent care for similar health conditions and experiences. And that, that's, that's inclusive of people with dementia, both living in care homes and in their own homes. In their own homes, they're more likely to miss appointments and follow-ups. So if they've got another condition, such as diabetes, for example, it might be that a practice nurse notices maybe a year on or two years on that, Mr. X hasn't turned up for his diabetic check. What, what's going on? And it, it might be that there are early changes and, and there are memory issues and that person fails to then manage their own conditions. Problem is that um, the difficulty is in recognizing the changes and the illness. There, are still, um, there is still quite a time lag between actually starting to recognize when something's wrong and actually getting that diagnosis. And we're still seeing in some instances that that can take years. Now the younger onset the dementia is, it, it can, you can, family can go down lots of blind alleys um, because with somebody under the age of 65, people don't automatically think dementia. It's becoming less of a problem in those over 65. We're now with the 75 check or the annual health check, primary care teams are starting to ask people if they have any worries about their memories. So we are st starting to see a little bit of a seed change. But I think that dementia still overshadows lots of other conditions and their management. And certainly Admiral nurses have written case study after case study of families that they're working with where the person with dementia has another disease which is poorly managed because the dementia overshadows or, or seems to complicate the perceptions of how those cases can be managed. I think what's also a, a, quite an issue is that visual and hearing impairments also seem to go rather unnoticed in dementia. A lot, because the dementia overshadows it, a lot of people put down deficits thereafter to the dementia and don't actually explore further. And the, then what we see is that care is heavily dependent upon the input of the family, mayor, uh, family carer uh, or supporter who knows that person well and can make the translations um, or explanations to other healthcare professionals in helping them to get the best possible care they can. So, the second part I want to look at is um, to explain where I came from with respect to my PhD. Now, this is going back some time now, um, given that I graduated in 2014 and my PhD was a part time study. So it feels like I've been doing it for forever. So if I can have the next slide, then I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this now. As I mentioned earlier, I was a consultant admiral nurse in North London. And what came with that job was the opportunity to undertake a PhD, which is a, a rare opportunity for nurses, I can tell you. So I, I, I felt very privileged. And I undertook that study at University College London. Now in my clinical practice, um, because my interest area was in uh, palliative and end of life care and indeed as Christine said um, I'd worked with the, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence and also with the National Council for Palliative Care in lobbying for better end of life care for people with dementia and early in 2000 the end of life care strategy came out and sort of said everybody should be encouraged to develop their own advanced care plan and clinically I thought well how, how's, how is that going to work in dementia? You know, how can people with dementia be best supported to think about their 
future care, their future wishes and preferences for end of life. And at that time, I was working with a, a, a clinician, an old age psychiatrist called Liz Sampson, who was working with the Marie Curie Palliative Care and Research Unit at UCL and was starting to emerge as the leading light really in looking at palliative and end of life care in dementia. So I literally took my little bag of PhD money to her academic department and said, I'd like to do my PhD with you, please. And I'm interested in advanced care planning. And one of the things that um, really struck me in my clinical practice with, was where a person with dementia is unable to articulate or to, to have the capacity to make their own choices, what happens then? You know, what happens? How do we support uh, family carers? And can we rely on carers' knowledge and influence to do, the, to do the right thing, to do the thing that the person with dementia would or wouldn't have wanted? I have the next slide. Right. So during phase one, I just wanted to explore, you know, what what people with dementia and their family carers thought about advanced care planning. Were they able to think about what might be important to, towards the end of life? You know, what choices might they wish to make for end of life? So I had what we call a nominal group, three nominal groups. They're, they're a bit like focus groups. They're a bit like discussion groups. I had one specifically with people with dementia. I had one with people with dementia and their family carer. And I had one group just with family carers alone. So next slide. Now, one of the interesting things that I found from the three groups was that the people with dementia were able to express to some degree what, what they might like for the future. But what they thought about um, was very much embedded in the here and now. Now, we often hear that people with dementia live very much in the present, and that was very true in this instance. They could think about um, deaths or, or experiences of people that they'd known and whether that was a good death or not, and whether they might or might not want that for themselves. But what, what they said was important to them was having their family around them, maintaining family links, being as independent as possible and, and having care that was um, thought about them, had them at the center. Now, what was, what was interesting as well um, is that when I interviewed the group that where there were people with dementia and their family carers, the family carers often spoke over the person with dementia or would often rhetorically say, no, 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 that's not what you want. That's not what you want. So it was starting to emerge that it's really important to have the conversation with the person with dementia so that we can be as sure as possible that they are able to express their own views and wishes. And these were some of the themes on this slide uh, that came through from both groups. Um, what, what was going on at the time um, was quite interesting because it influenced what people was saying. And I think if you think back to those days in, I think it was 2011, 2012, Terry Pratchett was diagnosed with dementia. Do you remember the, the, the author? And he was angry. He was angry and he was upset. And what, what he would say is that, now if I was diagnosed with cancer, a pathway of care would open out before me. And along that way would come in a Macmillan nurse, along that way would come in a, you know, a psychologist, I've had access to a hospice. But in dementia, he said, we're, we're scrabbling around in the undergrowth looking for that care pathway. And I'd, whilst on the one hand, he did a lot for dementia care, he, he raised awareness. He also did a bit of damage in that he then started to, he was angry and he started to look at euthanasia. He started to look at this, this life I have with dementia is, is not worth living. And I think that that, that damaged the, the, the whole um, drive of the National Dementia Strategy to support people to live well with dementia. And I think that what is important is to not just live well with dementia, but to support people to die well with dementia as well, because as sure as eggs is eggs, we're all going to die. Can I have the next slide, please? So the, the carer group, what, what was important to them 
was they didn't want their life to be unnecessarily prolonged. Now, at that particular time as well, the Liverpool Care Pathway, which is a, a, an end of life care pathway for healthcare professionals, was really taking a beating. And it was claimed that particularly in dementia care, the uh, people were put onto that end of life care pathway too soon. They were denied uh, extra time, if you like. And that influenced the, the family carers in their view. They were a bit divided. They felt that either the, the, the medical staff would either keep them going too long and experiment on them, or they would switch the machine off too soon. Now, the important thing, as I said before, to, to the people with dementia group was they just wanted to enjoy that that they enjoyed now. And that was family links, independence, exercise, activities. The dyad group, and by that I mean the person with dementia and the carer, were so influenced by the carer's views that the overriding um, theme for them also came out as no unnecessary prolonging of life. So this set me thinking for phase two. So if we could have the next slide. So what, what, what came through is that interestingly, discussing palliative and end of life care with people with dementia did not cause distress. And when I took my research to the ethics committee, which um, they, they approve studies to decide whether your research um, is not, you know, to make sure it's not going to harm anybody that's participant. They were very anxious that talking about death and dying might upset people with dementia. It didn't. They were readily willing and able to talk about it. What it did show is that there was a divergence of views um, between the person with dementia and the family carer. So what was important for one person was not necessarily important for the other. And that's important when we think about dementia care. So, as I said, when the person where the carer was present, they overly influenced the person with dementia. Um, and the person with dementia found it difficult to really think of their future selves. They, they thought about it in very concrete terms, but were able to fully express what was important to them at that moment in time. And there's no reason to believe that those things still won't remain important going forward. So the implications for this were that the, the direct approach is okay, but also how can we then ensure that family carers are fully aware of what the wishes and preferences of the person with dementia are. So I then went on to look at how, how, much, how much the carer understood the person with dementia's wishes. Now, everybody I interviewed had not got an advanced care plan. So I asked the family, the person with dementia first, in this certain situations, what would or wouldn't you want to happen? And an example I used was, if you had advanced cancer, as well as your dementia, and that cancer had spread, um, and you had six months to live, what would you want? Would you want this? Would you want treatment? Would you not want treatment? And I asked the family carer separately the same questions. If in this situation, what do you think the person with dementia that you care for may or may not want in this situation? And what I found was, even though the family members felt that they knew the person with dementia really well, their accuracy in being able to predict what the person with dementia might or might not have wanted for future, for their end of life care, was no better than chance. So one thing that that showed me is that we do need to have these conversations. There is a place for advanced care planning. If people don't make an advanced care plan, that's fine, but it's having the conversation. And what I found was that every one of the carers I interviewed after I'd finished the interview said, did I get it right? They, were, they, were, they really wanted to do the right thing. So I said, have the conversation. Don't be afraid, have the conversation. And several of those clinically, when I'd finished the study, came back and worked with the Admiral Nursing team to develop their advanced care plans. So next slide, please. 
So that, that's, that, that was the journey my PhD took me. But what I want to touch on now is where I'm at now with um, where I've taken my studies or my interest in this area too. So the next slide. So there's a couple of bits of work that, that I'm involved with and the, the issues around palliative and end of life care um, in dementia aren't just prevalent in the UK. These are issues that span across the whole country. So one of the things that I'm involved in is um, a, a research group. Um, we're looking at conceptualizing, well, what is a good death? What, what, what does a good death look like in dementia? And we're, we're, it says a meta qualitative study. So what it's done is it's bringing together researchers across the world that have looked at this in part with people with dementia and their family carers. And we're, we're still in progress with this one at the moment. So it involves uh, Brazil, Canada, parts of Europe, Australia, and Japan. So next slide, please. What we're, what we're doing is we've had focus groups with all of the researchers that have been involved in this type of work. So in a way, what it does is pull together all of our findings to make our understanding of the field stronger. So we looked at what each of the researchers had done and what they'd written, and um, we were all interviewed and our data was analyzed. So if we could have the next slide, please. So we're, we're only in early findings of this at the moment. We're at the point where we're, we've just submitted a paper for publication, but basically there were three overriding findings when we pulled all of our knowledge and data together. And the themes are pain and symptom control, good basic care, and a place like home. There were five other categories that were referred to. So say like keeping others life intact, being respected, having my preferences met, being connected, and my identity being preserved and satisfaction with life. Now it's not saying that all of those aren't important, they are, but I just wanted to look at the, the top three. So next slide, please. This might be a little bit tiny for you to look at, but what we, dis, what we sort of built up was an, an image of what this might look like. And some of these images are, are, are very, some of these issues are very physically related. Some of them are, 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 are about um, quality of life. And we tried to sort of zone them like this because in order to meet um, and provide high quality care, end of life care for people with dementia, all of these things need to be considered but also we need to consider them within the relationship with the carer and significant other people in the life. So underneath these main headings were lots of other things. Um, and one of the things was um, being respected as a person and preserved dignity for uh, identity, for example. And certainly in my study, um, one of the buzzwords that was going around in health and social care at the time was dignity. We must provide dignified care. We must consider the dignity of the person with dementia. But actually when we spoke to family carers and people with dementia, um, they knew the term, they knew the word dignity. But actually when we started to try and unpick, well, what does dignified care mean to you? They found it very difficult. And equally so when professional carers were asked to to discuss what they saw as dignified care, they found it very difficult to articulate. And that's a shame because dignified care is, is something that's bandied about in health and social care as if we're expected to know what that means. So I think that we do need to start to break that down a bit and consider what that might be. So next slide, please. So as I said, our early findings are that we've got a range of themes that actually um, articulate already what people with dementia and their carers perceive as being the, the circumstances of what a good death might look, look like. And because this is across, you know, centres across the world, we can actually say that, you know, this is regardless of cultural context. And some indicate that aspects of these are particularly challenging for us to achieve in dementia. However, 
differences uh, in the importance of the themes may relate to the extent to which they're modifiable, to which degree they can be changed, such as um, improving particular aspects of care. We can do something about those things. So wherever possible, we hope that our findings will indicate where we can change things um, and do something about that. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is um, another study that we're doing, and indeed the lead researcher of the last study wanted our data now, but we're not ready to share that. We're still in the process of interviewing people with dementia about what they consider is a good death. So if we can have the next slide, please. So there's a lot in, in uh, the clinical literature about what people perceive as a good death in other conditions. So like cancer, for example. So people with a diagnosis of cancer have been asked, what would a good death look like to you? So we're using that same approach to you with people with dementia. And I was fortunate enough to go on um, a study week to Brazil. And we, I met a group of like-minded people, clinicians that had the same um, interests. And we decided to do a study that looked at the UK situation and compared that with the Brazilian situation to start to look at things like religion and culture, as well as all the other things we know. So currently we're, we're sort of um, halfway through that. We've each recruited um, about 50% of the sample that we want. And the focus still seems to remain on clinical symptom management, such as pain. And culturally, some of the differences that we're starting to see at the moment, particularly between um, Brazil and the UK, is that Brazil is very much, probably about 95% a Roman Catholic um, state. So they, they, they are very much driven by their religion. Whereas in the UK, much, much less so, um, very, very mixed population. So if I could have the next slide, we've got a few quotes, which might be a bit difficult to see given the size. So, the qualitative, qualitative, and that means that we're studying the experiences of people with dementia, it'll give us a better understanding of what a good death is for a, for a person with dementia. And also, we'll be able to consider the views from these two different backgrounds. So next slide, please. So we're, we're now, the numbers are higher than this already. So we've now got nine interviews achieved in the UK, and we're up to nine in Brazil. So we're doing really well. The difficulty is we have to get them translated from Portuguese, which is the Brazilian language, and then collectively as a group, try and work out la the language use between the two of us. But there is need for continued control over their lives. People with dementia want this, um, but they have a realization that this may not be possible as the dementia progresses. And this distresses people with dementia and we need to work with them. We need to support them in this at this moment in time. We need to help them think about how we can better help them to think about the control that they might, might make them feel more comfortable as their lives, lives continue. I think that also what is emerging is that people with dementia have little faith in the health and social care system. They have little faith that we're, we will be able to meet their needs. And sadly, we're, we're still seeing a lot of people that um, have had personal experience of other people dying with dementia or dying in care homes. And they, they reflect on a situation that I really don't want that for myself. How can I make any difference to that now? And I've got a couple of quotes on the next slide for you. Karen, can I just flag this 10 minutes? Like, yeah, sure, we're nearly there. So people with dementia were saying, I haven't got a fear of dying per se, but what I have a fear of is dying either in pain or living a life where I'm not me and nobody does anything about it. Another one, said, a husband said, 
you know, my husband will give me the best care. I have every confidence if he cares for me. But if I do have to go into a care home, I don't have any confidence in the care that people in a care home will deliver to me because I've seen documentaries on the TV and I, and I see how difficult it is. Another quote said that they, they don't tell you what uh, this is and that is, and they don't tell you what they're going to do about it. So there's again, a sense of not being in control. And I think that one of, one of the things that is very different between the UK and Brazil in these early stages is that a lot of the British population don't have a reliance on a higher being or on God, um, whereas the population in Brazil that are a very uh, ardent Roman Catholic um, practice, practice Roman you know, Catholicism, believe in a higher order that I'll be okay, God will look out for me, God will, God will keep me safe, but that's not felt in the UK. So there's some of the early findings of that at the moment. Next slide, please. And I think this is important because there is still very, you know, as Terry Pratchett said, there is still no hardened path pathway to supporting people with dementia with consistency and continuity right from the point of diagnosis to their death and beyond in supporting family carers in their bereavement. So there's still so much to do in dementia care. And we, we know that at the moment, dementia care, what is provided is at a huge cost. But I think that pro the problem is that the cost is borne still largely by family members. And they call it a hidden cost, but it's the family carers pay much more for dementia care than the state does. And we have to change that. And we still see lots and lots of negative press about dementia care which is going to influence people's thinking about their futures and their end of life care a lot. So next slide, please. The last bit I want to look at is, um, so what in terms of COVID-19? How's dementia faring in this? Next slide. One of the problems during the first wave was that um, the, the mantra is, you know, stay at home, wear a mask, do this, do that, save the NHS. And this drive to save the NHS almost then started to look at what we call lifeboat ethics. So who are we going to allow into that lifeboat and who are we not? And I think that the clinicians, doctors especially, were expected to triage. That means decide who gets what, who gets the ventilation, who gets the treatment and ration it. You know, there was an expectation that it was going to be, we were going to have no beds in ITU, we were going to have no um, ventilation, no, you know, no resources. So who's going to get it? Um, and there was a, a massive removal of non-essential services um, and an intensification, if you like, of poor quality care. And I think that families affected by dementia have suffered quite badly, especially in the removal of non-essential care services. Um, and an intensification of poor quality care. So the rug was pulled under the feet of people with dementia, families affected by dementia, in that all of their community supports were seen as non-essential. And I think that that's um, going to reflect badly on us and be a huge, huge error of judgment. Next slide, please. The British Medical Association, they, they were offering guidance to doctors again that, you know, we, you must provide uh, compassionate and dedicated, dedicated medical care. And they are offered guidance again at how clinicians, doctors were expected to be the rationers of what was and what wasn't available if you required admission for COVID-19. And one of the things they advised was the application of a clinical frailty scale now we're coming back using the term frailty again. And that, that essentially is this guide here, but it wasn't developed to help doctors to decide whether to give people with dementia um, treatment for COVID or not. And one of the things, if this was applied, and, and it is used um, in, in surgery, for example, if considering certain types of surgical interventions in severe dementia, but such a scale of this, really, really does potentially badly affect young onset dementia and people in the earlier stages of dementia, 
where they're being inappropriately judged against a, an assessment scale that isn't really giving the information the doctor needs at that particular time. Next slide, please. But NICE made a bit of a, a sort of a, a backward step on this and several um, lead academics and clinicians in dementia care, um, included, including Dementia UK and myself, championed NICE to reconsider and actually to review their guidance and say that um, even mild symptoms of dementia might inflate or, or increase the score on that scale, which then would make um, people with dementia unable to access care, which by rights they should get. So we were able to change that. So next slide, please. And indeed also the Care Quality Commission, people know what this is, it's the regulatory body that um, looks at the quality of healthcare, it looks at the quality of care homes, it looks at the quality of domiciliary care. And they, they again said that these blanket decisions weren't appropriate, but they did encourage people to develop an advanced care plan. Because if anything in these situations, an advanced care plan would help some of those clinicians and doctors during these very strange and complex time to have an understanding of what the wishes and person uh, preferences of the person with dementia might be. And this almost brings me back full circle to where my, my initial opening um, explanations and discussions were about my research interests people really should consider having an advanced care plan. And I'd be very interested to know how many people on this call have their own advanced care plan to actually apply in situations where they may not have the capacity to express these. And whether you've got dementia or not, if you did get COVID-19 and had to be ventilated, you wouldn't be able to say what you might or might not want. So that's when something like an advanced care plan would really come into its own. Next slide. Who I've done, Christine. Thank you, Karen. Wow, thank you. That's an enormous amount of uh, information and thought provoking um, content to digest. Ended on a complete bombshell there, Karen, as well. You know, how many of us have got an advanced care plan? And um, the, the context of COVID has certainly made that existential crisis for us all, the, the actual reality that sure as eggs is eggs, as Karen said, that this could be us um, at any time. Um, I, there are a couple of questions that have come up on the chat. Um, one was about will the slides be shared? And I need to talk to Karen about that. So I don't know the answer to that at the moment, uh, but certainly the video will be, and that will have the slides on it. I'm not sure how much of that information Sharon wants to make in the public domain for other people at the moment. You don't need to answer that now, Karen. We'll have I, I, I'm happy to share them. Okay, that's, so that's the answer, okay. Um, so if you do want the slides, could you email us? Because we don't want to email a whole load of um, slides to people that don't want them. So can you specifically email um, the uh, research at Loros email box to let us know if you want them? The other question that came up was um, why carers may be not very um, uh, accurate at predicting the wishes of their loved one. And that wasn't so much the sort of scenarios, but in the saying that uh, not prolonging life would be the um, thing that um, was most important, I think, um, was the, the context. And whether it was that they were actually reflecting something the patient or the person with dementia had actually said themselves earlier, but wasn't saying at the time you were interviewing. I think that was a sort of tricky question for you there. Do you think that the other, it was a relative view or do you think they were reflecting something that was a, um, a patient's, a person's view? I, I apologise for not getting that point across better. Um, what, what I found was that the, the family carers were influenced by, negatively influenced by what was in the media. So Terry Pratchett's view, the Liverpool Care Pathway. I think there was a programme on um, can you remember uh, Jerry Robinson can fix it? He was a businessman and he went into different oh, yeah. organizations and as a, from a business perspective, he said, I can fix this. 
and he went into to care homes over two, uh, two episodes, he went into care homes. And I think one of them actually was in Leicester. And he said, I can fix this, and he couldn't. And within a, a matter of weeks, one of them had actually closed down. He couldn't fix dementia care in care homes. So all of these things had a very negative um, effect on the perception of family carers in the media. So on the one hand, they were caring for this person with dementia, and they found it distressing to see the changes in, in their loved one. But also they were thinking, well, if this was me with dementia, what, what, you know, what would I want for myself? So they were influenced so negatively that they wanted no unnecessary prolonging of life. And I suppose I've put that in a more delicate, sensitive way. Some actually spoke of euthanasia, even though it's not legal in the UK. Now, one of the, the, the other thing was that um, the, both the person with dementia and the family carer, they each felt they knew each other really well. So the, the, the person with dementia felt, well, my daughter knows me really well. She knows what I do and don't want. And similarly, the daughter felt as though she should know what the person, you know, her mum wanted. But actually, when, it, when, when it, you actually probed a little bit deeper, because they hadn't had any conversation, no guidance, no support to talk about advanced care planning fully, they were off the mark, they didn't know. And it's, it's that old saying, isn't it? You don't know what you don't know. Um, so it wasn't that they were had any bad intention or, or didn't want to do the right thing. They very much wanted to do the right thing. But what, what came out of it was they didn't, nobody had discussed with them what can I expect? What my end of life care and dementia look like? What might be the things I have to talk about as a, in a family? What might be the things that um, I have to make decisions on or think about my wishes and preferences? So even down to the fact that many people as they advance in dementia may have swallowing problems or indeed lose their swallow altogether. Nobody had had those conversations at the point of diagnosis, so they didn't know what to expect. So it, 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 it can be a very much more complex situation than knowing or not knowing. Thank you, Karen. We are out of time for the allotted slot. There are some really um, important questions coming through about advanced care planning and what should be considered and what form should we use and how do we do it. Um, so important that we couldn't really do them justice in a in a very short answer. And I'm wondering how we take that forward. Um, um, short answer is to the person who asked about my mum's in a care home, what should I consider is to talk to the people running the care home because they will be familiar with this. So that's an immediate address. But I think there's such an interest in what is advanced care planning, what should I think about, that I think we need to think about having another opportunity to come together um, as professionals and um, people who need advanced care plans, and that's all of us, um, to think about um, how do we do this together as professionals and, and um, uh people who have immediate needs or longer term needs to think about it. Does that sound a sensible option? Would you join another session at some point to have more discussion specifically about the conversation and creating some sort of plan? I'd be more than happy to discuss advanced care planning in much greater depth and to offer some resources. And We've, we've got a very nice section on the Dementia UK website. Um, you know, if you just Google Dementia UK, uh, planning, uh, planning for my future, um, we've developed a guide and a template that you can use. And both of those were developed in partnership with people with dementia and family carers and other experts. Um, but more than happy to come back if you, if you like. Fantastic. Thank you. So thanks for the comments from a few people saying yes, yes, yes. 
Um, I'm going to close the session by um, thanking you all for coming and asking for your feedback on the session. There'll be a poll that comes up on your screen that you click the answers to. But it's been delightful that um, this, this um, virtual way of, of discussing important and sensitive topics across the spectrum of backgrounds has been well received. Um, it's hard to tell from faces exactly um, what was going on, but I think the comments are suggesting that it's been extremely useful. And I will share your um, answers to the poll. If you stick around long enough, you can see what your views are in comparison to other people's. But if you have to go, thank you very much for attending. We'll be in touch about future sessions. And thank you, Karen, for offering. Um, and all take care.